Hello and welcome to Iggy's Toy Parade and Soldier Review. Once again, this is your host, Iggy. And as you can see, we're continuing with the space theme. And we have a toy here manufactured by Playmates. And I think this toy was made in 2004. Uh, it says on the bottom, I would pick it up and look at it again, except for the figure that I have in the um, transportation pad is not sitting on there very well. Uh, the figure actually needs a base in order to stand up properly. So it's delicately balanced in there. And uh, that's actually a G.I. Joe figure, believe it or not. Um, and this toy was uh, rather ambitious uh, because of its special effects features. And I'm going to demonstrate those without further ado. So hang on. It's already turned on because you can see a light in there. And I'm going to manipulate these controls here. And we'll see what happens. <laughs> Isn't that cool? All right, let's bring the guy back. Where's the buttons? Here they are. I love this thing. Now, for some reason, I thought it made sparkles when I first got it. But it's not. I, maybe that's a uh, Mandela memory or something, because uh, this, of course, isn't doing that. Uh, there is a light bulb up here that you're supposed to replace. And I took a look at that, and uh, it looked like it was okay. But when I look inside, I can't see it doing anything. So maybe that's why it's not doing the sparklies. Um, it is very difficult for me to get this figure in here. There is a back door to this. However, my f hand is too fat to really fit in the chamber properly to set him up. It kept falling over, falling over. I finally got him to stand up, but he's not centered the way I would prefer him to be. Um, I would prefer it if he was standing like right here instead of over here. So let's do that again so you guys can get a look at it. Oops, I didn't do it right. Let's try this. And I had my hand in the way. Let's try it again. Okay, we're going to rematerialize back in the enterprise in a, in the prize enter. That's all, folks. Now, I, I guess it depends on how you manipulate manip manipul. Wow, I sure have a weird speech impediment. It depends on how you manipulate, not manipulate. Um, this is not that kind of video. How quickly you use these buttons to how smoothly he reappears. So let me try it again. Nope. Nope. I notice that sometimes if you go too fast, it doesn't make the uh, uh, transportation noises. See now, because I did it too fast, that's the sound it's supposed to make. There we go. Got it. See, in that time, I took off too soon. Anyway, it's kind of fun toy. 
I admit I've spent way too much time <laughs> fooling around with this today. But um, this is a, a, uh, a, a plot device that Gene Roddenberry introduced in the original classic Star Trek series. And the reason Gene Roddenberry came up with this idea of the transporter was to avoid the costly models and sets that it would require to show the spaceship uh, going through the atmosphere and landing on the planet and the people going outside of the uh, spaceship or the shuttle. Shuttle has the same problem. They Although they did... Uh, uh, create a shuttle for the classic Star Trek series called the Galileo. And, but anyway, it was a cost saving. So necessity is the mother of invention is the, uh, the old saying, I guess. And in this case, it was a pretty clever way of avoiding those kinds of uh, financial costs of producing the show. I thought it was pretty brilliant because now it's it's such a a, a common science fiction trope that uh, we don't even think twice about it anymore. So you guys have all said this yourself and have heard it, and it's beam me up, Scotty. We've each of us have probably said it or heard someone else say beam me up, Scotty, or something to that effect. Um, it's interesting because that has actually never been said in a Star Trek episode. And you're like, oh, come on, Iggy. We all know that he says, beam me up, Scotty. And the truth of the matter is that's never said. Another example of that is Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes stories. Uh, we're all familiar with uh, elementary, my dear Watson. He never says that in an Elma, in a um, Sherlock Holmes story. It's never said. Now he 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 flirts around that phrase by saying things like uh, "it's elementary," but he doesn't say "it's elementary, my dear Watson." He also says things like "my dear Watson." But he never says in a story, elementary, my dear Watson. So where does that come from? Why are we so familiar with that? Well, I think it first appears in a play in 1908. And then it shows up in a movie in 1929. But it doesn't become popular a lot. Pop here I go again with my weird speech pattern. Uh, please beam me up, Scotty. I'm having trouble here. It does not become part of popular culture until Basil Rathbone says it in uh, Sherlock Holmes movies from starting in 1939. I think they made like, I don't know, eight or, you know, around eight or ten Sherlock Holmes movies with Nigel Bruce and um, Basil Rathbone. I thought Basil Rathbone made a pretty good Sherlock Holmes. My favorite Sherlock Holmes is um, Jeremy Brett. Um, I thought that was pretty. I saw a play featuring the two actors that played in that series when I was in London, and I enjoyed that tremendously. I forgot why I was talking about this. Oh, uh, how a, a phrase becomes part of popular culture, although it was never actually written. Um, by the way, this is a side note. I guess most of what I just said was a side note. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle got his knighthood not from writing Sherlock Holmes, but for writing a history of the Second Anglo-Boer War. What was considered the Second Anglo-Boer War. Some people would argue there was actually four Anglo-Boer Wars, but um, uh, a 
lot of historians refer to the War of 1899 to 1902, I think it was, as the Second Anglo-Boer War. And he wrote a, uh, a volume about the war that uh, pleased Queen Victoria, and he was knighted as a result. So what does all that have to do with Beam Me Up Scotty? Well, in the Star Trek series, they also flirt around that phrase, but ultimately you could consider it a misquote. And what do they say in the TV show? Well, they say things like, beam me up, Mr. Scott. Scotty, beam us up. Scotty, beam us up. Beam them out of there, Mr. Scott. So we have Scotty beam us up, beam them out of there, Mr. Scott, and beam me up, Mr. Scott. But he never says, uh, beam me up, Scotty. Now, it became so common that to say, beam me up, Scotty, that James Doohan, when he published his biography, actually names his book, be me up, Scotty. And uh, William Shatner uses the phrase when he recorded an audio book, or rather an audio adaptation of his Star Trek book, Ashes of Eden. He will have Kirk say, be me up, Scotty. But otherwise, in, in uh, the TV show, that's never actually said. And all that business about the Anglo-Boer War was just to get to that. I probably should have edited that a little bit, right? <laughs> anyway, this is a fun toy. And um, I'm going to show it to you now. We'll, we'll circle around a little bit. I'm going to put the light back on it. I had to uh, take the light off so that you could uh, see the special effect there. I think it's done with mirrors because if you open the, the back door, you can actually see a mirror back here. This is where you put the figure in. And see that mirror? And it's, right, it's right there. Now, I'm guessing that when you manipulate these levers over here, that it turns the mirror or something. I'm not quite sure how they do it. But it's kind of a fun special effect. Because I didn't have a Star Trek figure, I was going to put a horse in there. There's episodes of Star Trek where uh, people are rematerialized and they come back as a sort of globular mass of matter or they are turned into twins although how that could happen is be, I don't know because there wouldn't actually be enough matter to construct two identical twins uh, perhaps if they were reduced in size by 50 percent I suppose that could happen um uh, what was some of the other accidents? Oh, uh, uh, they have people coming from a parallel universe. You remember? You remember the episode where Spock? Uh, I mean, um, yeah, Spock has a goatee in the evil universe, and then uh, Kirk is good in the evil universe, and bad Kirk is in the good universe. And that's actually a fun show. I like that episode. I should show you the back of this, too. Huh? So let's take a look at the bottom, because I said that it was 2004, but I want to make sure I'm giving you the right information. And it says here, uh, I can't see it. Is it 2003? Is that 2003, guys? Anyway, that's the battery compartment. So it's sort of a neat toy. 
Now, is is are transporters even feasible? And the answer to that is no. And the reason for it is it would require an insane amount of energy in order to to uh, dematerialize the molecular structure of just even your brain because of all the atoms that are in your brain. And it would, so not only would it require a great deal of energy, but you wouldn't be able to transport matter through other matter because what would happen is the molecules would interact with other molecules. And, and also in order to transport you, they would, it would kill you. And when you rematerialized, you would be essentially a different person. So that's another issue that you can't uh, send matter through matter. Also, no matter what, matter cannot uh, move faster than the speed of light. Matter just doesn't work that way. So that's another uh, difficulty with it. And in 200 years, will they have, or 300 years or 400 years, whenever Star Trek takes place, will they have the technology in order to do these things? I, I don't know. I really don't, but it would be cool. However, I don't think I would be the first one to get in the thing. Um, also, there's uh, episodes where someone is going to be transported and they are in like another dimension and all these other issues with the transporter. But it makes for great stories, so it's a fun thing to have. So let's show you the box before we uh, finish up, because I did keep the box on this. And it's right here. That's probably why this thing isn't broken. Let's turn it. There we go. Oh, gosh, there's not much room here. There you can see it with a Star Trek... Uh, next generation figure, Captain Picard. Hmm. New special transporting effect. Well, I don't see that it sparkles here on the box, so I guess... That was a false memory on my part, but I uh, this is the first time I've seen this in probably 25 years. No, not 25 years, 20, 19 years. So you're, see, I thought it did sparkles like that, but I guess it didn't. Oh, well, so that's the box for it. All right, guys, that's all I've got for you on the transporter. This is video episode number 199. So my next video is going to be a return to my beginning. And what I mean by that is the first video I ever made for you guys was my uh, Battleground playset by Marx. And I at the time, I... Um, my I didn't have it set up. I just showed it in the box and I got some complaints. And this one guy said, you suck because, you know, I didn't set it up. And he said, I, I patiently waited through both episodes and you didn't even set it up. So what I'm going to do is rectify that error by setting up the, uh, the figures for you. And it's a combination of two Battleground playsets from 1977. And uh, I got it for Christmas in 1977. Okay, guys, that's it. Should we say, beam me up, Scotty? Or should I say, um, beam us out of there, Mr. Scott? I don't know. We're so used to the other phrase.
So I'm just going to beam out. Bye.